Now here's an uh, interesting question. Uh, Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. The labor is worthy of his hire, frequently applied to the evangelist, etc., being full-time in the work. In 1 Timothy 5, verses 17 and 18, he uses the same words of the elders that rule well, worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Does this not allow for full-time elders where their spiritual work is their main occupation and they are to be rewarded, in brackets, or paid with material things, money, etc.? First Timothy chapter 5 is dealing, and, and into chapter 6, is dealing with the care of God's people. It deals with the care of widows. It deals with the care of um, those who are slaves. It deals with the care of elders um, and uh, the issue of uh, women, whether they should marry or not after they have lost their husbands. Uh, it deals with visitation and uh, ver various other subjects. So, but it's, it, it's practical teaching relative to the care of God's people. And so in the little section about elders, in verse 17, it says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Now that word honor, uh, you'll notice down in chapter 6 and verse 1, which is the next main paragraph, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. So if we assume that honor means money, financial help, does this mean that slaves are to give all their money to their masters? Well, probably not. So it must mean something bigger than that. We discover that sometimes honor can mean financial remuneration. It can mean that. Um, sometimes it means other things. So it doesn't automatically mean that. In the context, we don't think so. He uses two illustrations. Uh, the, the ox is not to be muzzled that treads out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his hire. These are reward. These are two illustrations. Paul is not saying that an elder is a hireling any more than he's saying he's an ox. Right? These are two illustrations an illustration of an ox, and an illustration of a laborer, of a, of a hireling. And in both cases, he says, there's a, there's a direct relationship between what the ox and what the laborer does and what they receive. That's his point. He's not saying, um, if an ox works for you and treads out the corn, you ought to put the feed bag on when he gets back to the barn. What he's saying is, that if an ox is treading out the corn, he deserves to eat some of the corn that he's treading out. And if a man makes money for you, he deserves to take some of that money home. There's a direct relationship between what the man does and what he enjoys. So, an elder does certain things in the life of the assembly. He uh, teaches the word, he encourages the saints. He's hospitable. Uh, he does. He, he guides. He, he does all sorts of things. Right? It should not be a one-way street. Elders who are doing these things should receive remuneration. Now, not necessarily financial. There are some elders don't need the money. Does that mean they don't get any honor? No. They should get honor. They should be honored for their work's sake. And what does that mean? Well, it means that they ought to receive some benefit back. If they encourage us, we ought to encourage them. If they're hospitable to us, we should be hospitable to them. If they think about the financial needs of the people of God, those who are out of work, the widows, the poor, we should think about their financial needs. That's included. But it's not the main meaning of this because there are elders who who don't. Now, uh, the Roman Empire was 70% slaves in the days of the New Testament. You don't think that most assemblies had full-time paid elders. That probably isn't the case. 
And you'll notice here that it says in verse 17, the elders that rule well should be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So it's not just um, one or two elders, uh, it's, it's all the elders who rule well, and especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So I, I don't think that Paul is saying that all the elders ought to be on payroll. I think what he is saying is this, that if the elders are caring, as we have it here for the widows and the poor and so on, we ought to care for them. And there are elders whose businesses suffer financially because they give themselves to visiting and to, and to the work of God. I know one elder, and um, he, he has a real estate business, and his real estate business suffers because he's out there caring for the people of God. Well, we ought to care for him. If he has, um, uh, the same, in the same way, a widow who is out serving, we ought to buy some gas for her car. We ought to, somebody who's uh, sending letters to missionaries, if they need stamps, get them stamps. Get them uh, material goods. I think absolutely, that's great. You ought to do it. But if, and I've seen this happen before, if one elder is put on the payroll, however you arrange that, it makes the other Christians lazy. And I don't know how, how other, otherwise to say it. I've seen it happen time and time again that um, if one elder is, is essentially being financially looked after, the others start to say, when he says, let's go out visiting, they say, brother, you know, we work all day. That's why we, you know, <laughs> this is your work. And so uh, what happens then is that the, the one elder, he becomes the servant to those who give him his financial help. I talked to a man one day who um, had, had been a school teacher. They'd had problems with their pastor. Eventually the pastor left, and the Christians were quite sore wounded. And they said to this school teacher, well, you know how to teach the word. Why don't you teach us? And so while he was teaching, he began to teach the word of God in this little church. After a while, they said, look, you're doing this you're doing such a good job here. Why don't we just give you a little salary? You quit your teaching job. He said to me, you don't realize what a short chain you put a man on when you give him a salary. Because now, you see, they controlled what he said. You pay the piper, you call the tune. That's how it works. So there may be ways around that. I I happen to be an artist, you see, and I did all sorts of nice Bibles and sets of books for ministers in various churches where the majority of the congregation didn't like what they were preaching and had given them their papers to move on, you see. And there was a minority in the church and they appreciated them and they were giving, them, giving him a nice send-off, some nice little gift. Because now those who sit in the pews control the public ministry of the Word of God. And that's not a happy situation. Now, maybe there are cases where that, can, that doesn't happen. I, I'm not sure. It, it doesn't seem to work in most cases. Um, I think that what, what we see here happening then is that there will be only certain men who will teach the Word of God. One man ends up with the bulk of teaching. And then you know what happens? The loyalty of the Christians is to the man who does the teaching. And if that man begins to teach something that the other elders don't agree with, they have absolutely, they don't have a leg to stand on. The loyalty is to that man. And we've seen lots of situations where there, there are divisions in the flock over that very situation. So when I read this, I see that the illustrations that are used, Paul is not calling elders hirelings, you know, in other words, men who ought to be paid. What he is saying is that if a man works for me, he makes me money, he ought to share in it. If a man encourages me, he ought to be encouraged, he should share in it. If he teaches me the word, I should appreciate that and show my appreciation. And the assemblies of God's people should provide good books for those who study and teach us the word. Uh, they ought to provide gas money for them when they travel teaching the word. Uh, they ought to come and cut their grass or their hedges. Young people, if, you, if there's a man who's laboring in the Word to teach you, you should find ways to reciprocate and to encourage him in that because it's hard work. It takes a lot of time. And you say, listen, brother, you're studying to teach us the Word of God. We want to look after your garden. We want to, we want to do things for you to free you up so you can do that work. I think that's the principle here. 
reciprocation, the sharing, so it's not all one way. They're doing all the labor, we've got all the benefits. Now if a preacher comes to town, oh yeah, we want to give him something, you see. But if uh, one of our local brethren is laboring in the word and teaching us, uh, he hardly gets a thank you at the door. Well, that shouldn't be the way. There should be reciprocation. There should be encouragement. We should be thinking practically about our elders. And it may well be that there are some elders that we will have financial help with. Absolutely. I don't think that's the primary meeting because there are other elders who don't need our financial help. Then that means they don't get any quote-unquote wink-wink honor. See? <laughs> I think everyone who labors, everyone who cares, everyone who visits, everyone who's doing the work of God, they ought to be receiving back. It shouldn't be just them expending themselves. They should be receiving back whatever it is that will enhance and encourage their ministry. And it may be encouragement, it may be hospitality, it may be a m manual labor helping them, it may be gas for their car, it may be uh, good books to study with, and it may be some financial help. It may be. But as soon as you have some sort of red, regular arrangement, you do this for us, we do that for you, it takes it away from the joy, from the, from the spontaneity, from the, from the love of doing it. It's one thing for me if my wife, uh, um, you know, she does nice things for me all the time. And so I say, honey, I'm going to pay you for this. She doesn't want to pay. I couldn't pay her enough for what she does. But if I say, let me do some things for you, I'd like to do this for you, I'd like to make your life a little easier. There are things you can do that I can't do, but there are some things I can do for you. Well, she appreciates that. And I think that's the spirit of this passage. I don't think the idea is some sort of pay being given to the elders. Now, there are brethren who see otherwise, and I love them too.